have hope, we have peace, we have joy, we have rest in the Lord. Worship with the choir today.
Often we don't understand the struggles in this life. Though we trust his perfect plan, we sometimes question why. All the tears we've cried, every sleepless night, it will be worth it all. the Lord a hand today. It's going to be worth it all when we reach heaven.
and we meet our Savior face to face. If you would, stand with us this morning. Shake a couple of hands around you and tell them you're glad to see them in the house of the Lord. We're going to give you a chance to sing praise and worship with us. So let them know you're glad to see them in the house of the Lord today.
thought I was worth saving So you came and changed my life You thought I was worth keeping So you cleaned me up inside You thought I was to die for So you sacrificed your life So I could be free So I could You were worth saving. So you came and changed my life. You, you thought I was worth keeping. Oh, you didn't throw me away. Oh, you beat me up inside. You thought I was to die for. So you sacrificed your life so I could be free, so I could be free. Worth saving. You thought I was worth 
the saving Lord. So you came and changed my life. You thought I was worth keeping. So you cleaned me up inside. You thought I was to die for. So you sacrificed your life. So I could be free. So I could be whole. So I could tell it. Turn my mic on. Good morning. Praise the Lord. Isn't it good to be in the house of God today? Amen. We're excited about what God is doing today. I want to go ahead and call the ushers forward for the offering, but while they're coming forward, I do want to make one announcement. You'll notice we've been running the announcements on the screen and in the bulletin, so make sure you're reading your bulletin and make sure you're looking at the screen, but there was one left off that I want to make sure that you guys get. There's going to be a bus trip on Saturday, October 14th, the Crown Coliseum, the Gaither Vocal Band. Tickets are $28 for the adults, the seniors $25. Let Larry or Judy Massengill know if you plan to go so talk to Larry and Judy about that that's really the only announcement that I'm going to make this morning are you happy to be in the house of God today amen amen have you come to worship the Lord today have you come to to, to just allow him to move in your spirit today amen all right, all right. Well, let's go ahead and, and pray over our offering this morning. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for this day that you've given us, Lord. You are so good to us. Day in and day out, Lord, you give us everything that we need. And Lord, we thank you for your provision, God, in our lives, Lord. And Lord, today as we, we give in this offering, Lord, we give with that same spirit that you give to each one of us, God. Lord, we ask that you would just take this offering, Lord, that you would bless it, multiply it, use it for your kingdom. God bless the gift and the giver, and it's in Jesus' name we pray today. Amen.
Amen. It's good to be back. Amen. It's good to be back today. I feel like it's been like six weeks since I've been up here. I know it's only been a couple weeks, Sundays anyway, since I went, went on vacation, but, uh, but I'm glad to be back. I thank you for the break. Amen. Amen. All right. We fired up today. Hallelujah. <laughs> I have had some that have come to me and want to be anointed and prayed for. And as soon as I'm done preaching, we're going to pray for you and anoint you. Amen. Amen. Uh, but I want to get this word out because I believe this is an important word for you today. Carrington, the last song you just had up, um, the one slide, you have changed me or whatever. Um, can you find that for me real quick? I know it's in there someplace. Carrington's so good at this stuff, man. She just whips it up there. That's it right there. I want, you, you, you know, we sing these songs. These songs are important. Okay? Songs are important. It's important what you sing. It's important what you profess. Right? It's important what you say. Okay? Because you see, many times what you say, it, 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 it impacts who you are. Okay? I mean, I mean you, and if, you, if, you, if you, what you say is not impacting who you are, then you're in trouble. Right? Because then you're not really who you say you are. And if you're not really who you say you are, then in many terms they call that a hypocrite. Right? You do one thing and you say another thing. A lot of people can talk the talk, but when it comes to walking the walk, that's where they fall down. That's where they fall short. They know exactly what to believe. They know how to say it. But when it comes down to really living it out, that's where the rubber hits the road, right? When you got to figure it out. But I wanted to just think about this for a second, this song, and I don't know who wrote it or whatever. But I started reading this, and I said, you know, all things work together for the good. Amen? For those who are called by God, that love God, that are called according to His purpose, His plan in life, it all works out. And so I was looking at this, and I said, wow, I could have put that right in the sermon today. It says, you thought I was worth saving, right? The Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross because He thought that we, as mankind, right, we're worth saving. Well, praise God that he thought we were worth it. Right? Because if he didn't think we were worth it, then we'd all be lost today. It says, so you came and you changed my life. It said, you thought I was worth keeping. So what would you do? You cleaned me up inside. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. I'm going to tell you, folks. Problem in today's church is that people skip that part. You clean me up inside. Right? They want to live however they want to live and go to church on Sunday and profess one thing. And then Monday through Saturday, live another. And some people take offense when I say stuff like that. But I'm here to tell you, if you've got the Holy Spirit of God living in you, then this is His temple. Amen? Each one of us are the temple of God, and as such, we're supposed to be a holy place. We're supposed to be a holy people without spot, waiting for the return of Christ to come and get his bride. Oh, my goodness. Today, I want to talk about sanctification, right? A lot of folks, while they don't even know what sanctification is, it's just one of those theological words. Right? That we throw it out there. Sanctification, justification, all these different things. We throw them out there. We have no understanding what it is. So today I want to want to talk about sanctification. I'm, I'm, I've been working on this. I've read like four books this week. I mean, really. I, went, I ordered. Amazon's an incredible thing. Right? <laughs> Jane, Sister Jane, you use Amazon. I use Amazon. I love it. I got second day delivery. If it's something, if the Lord really lays something in my spirit, I get on there and I start ordering. Boop, 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 boop. And bam, there they are at my door in two days, praise God. And I can open it up. Right? My wife asked me yesterday. I got four books in the mail the other day. She said, Rick, how many of those books are you reading? I said, all of them. <laughs> And all at once, I'd have one over here and one over there and one over here and one over there. I mean, you know, maybe I'm a little ADD, okay? I don't know. But I mean, I was putting everything in I could put in. Look, I believe in the power of the Word of God, amen? Because it's the Word where we start. It's the Word that gives us comfort. It's the Word that gives us wisdom. It's the Word that does all those things. But there's also a power in 
fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who are endued with the very same spirit from on high that you are. As my brother Dexter told me this morning, amen, that we sharpen one another, praise God. As we, as we come together, we sharpen one another. We, we work together with one another. We, and, and so when I read these books a lot of times, I'm letting someone else sharpen me. Right? If you're never putting anything in, then you'll never get but the uh, same thing out. Right? If you want to change what's coming out, you got to change what you're putting in. Right? I mean, you can't just be the same all the time and, and then think that something different is going to happen. I want to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting in verse 3 today. I am... Um, I'm very serious about this whole sanctification thing because there's a, an incredible amount of, uh, of discussion. There's an incredible amount of, of theories. There's an incredible amount of theology. There's an incredible amount of argument. There's been an incredible amount of church splits of, of things where people couldn't uh, get along and they couldn't agree to disagree so they would just split. Right? Because of, of their perception of what God's doing. And so many times, as I told my brother this morning, you know, we're going around the same mountain. We're just coming from different sides, praise God. But so many times we want to argue about things. We want to fight about things. I watched on Facebook this week, and, and somebody put a post on there, and it had nothing to do with anything hardly. It was just kind of one of those posts where you're supposed to examine yourself. And about a hundred and some posts later, they had an absolute theological knockdown, drag out fight. And I'm not talking about sinners in the sense that we would say people that are not church folks. I'm talking about pastors. I'm talking about people that are supposed to be sanctified, full of the Holy Ghost, once full of the repository of truth. And yet they argued and fought, and it just was absolutely ugly. Over what? Right? See, the devil, he, <laughs> the devil has, doesn't have to worry about people not believing. All he's got to do is divide the believers. If I can just get them to fight each other, they'll fight each other. I can stop them dead in their tracks. Whether they believe in God or not, I can stop them dead in their tracks. I can stop them. I want you to think about that for a second. How many times do you get in discussions with someone and, and get heated and get in a fight and then you leave and you're no longer, you don't even feel like you're friends with the person anymore because you've gotten such a fight? And tell me this, how many times was that person one of your family members? There ain't nothing like a family fight. <laughs> right? The closer someone is to you, the madder they can get you. Amen. Right? Right? I mean, because they know all how to push all your buttons. They know how to make you mad. They know how to fire you up. They know exactly where you stand on things. And they can get you wound up. In the church, it's the same way. People fight and rip and rare. Over things where a lot of times they're agreeing. They're actually in agreement, but they just can't seem to get the words right. I want to talk today about sanctification. About being made holy. About being made in the image of God. You know, once upon a time in the church, that was an important concept. Be ye holy as I'm holy. The Word of God says that. How many of us are, are working on a daily basis to be holy as God is holy? I mean, how, 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 are we, how are we working this out? Because you see, there was a verse, and, I, and, and the verse that I started with the other day was in Thessalonians. I asked Rodney, I said, Rodney, do you know where that verse is? I yell across the office when we're in there. Hey, Rodney, <laughs> what ver where is it in the Bible where it says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling? And he's like, I don't know, Rick, but it's in there. And I said, I know it is too, and I got a concordance, and I'll look it up. And I looked it up, right? I looked it up, and uh, I found that verse. I said, well, I know, I know it's in there. It's actually in Philippians chapter 2. And, and so, so I, I want to, in one sense, I'm going to start with, with another book, but I want to show you where, where I started this week. In verse 12 in chapter 2 of Philippians, it says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And I, that bothered me for a second there because I'm like, I'm not a works righteousness kind of guy, okay? I believe that God is the one that does the work in you. But then I read the rest of the verse because a lot of times we stop. 
Right? Isn't that true? Don't people take verses and they take it and they snatch it out of context and they pull it out and they make it mean something that it isn't. If I just stopped right there, it would say that I've got to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. It's up to me. But then the very next verse says, for it is who? God who works in who? You or me both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Well, then I'm sitting now, I'm confused. Right? Does that confuse any of you? Does that confuse you? Anybody? Anybody here confused? Maybe I'm just not the sharpest tool in the shed. Right? But it confused me because I'm like, hold on, you just told me to work out my salvation with fear and trembling, but now you're telling me it's God who works in me, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So which one is it, God? And I realized there was more to this story than meets the eye. First of all, I want to say this, that there's, there's two things that take place in our, in our walk of faith. The first thing is justification. The second thing is sanctification. The first thing is justification. Does anybody know what it means to be justified? It means to be made not guilty. Okay? It means to be slid from the guilty column over to the not guilty column. Justified means that when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that at that moment in time, right then, wherever you were at, whether it was the altar of the church or a parking lot or Walmart or in your bedroom at night or wherever it was, when you asked the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your heart, save your soul, forgive you from all your sins, right then, bam, you were justified. Praise God, you were slid over from guilty to innocent in the eyes of God. Hallelujah. That's something to be excited about. Praise God. I hear so many people say, well, they didn't mean it. Well, I'm here to tell you that when you pray that kind of prayer, God means it and he justifies you. Bam! Right then. He forgives you from all unrighteousness. He cleanses you from all sin. Every sin that you ever committed in your life up to that point, whoo, you have been cleansed. Right? He cleaned you out inside. Oh, he got rid of all that baggage train that you've been dragging around all your life. It's gone. He cut it loose. It's gone. And something happens when you're justified in your spirit. Your spirit is made complete in the eyes of God. Your spirit is cleansed. Your spirit at that point in time is sanctified, made holy. Hallelujah. That's exciting news. And then comes life. And then comes the next day. Right? And then comes that temptation. And then comes that thing that's out there in front of you. And you're struggling and you're fighting. Because you see, when you got saved. And see, a lot of folks, maybe they didn't have a whole lot to be saved from. Right? Some people, they've been good all their life. Really, the only thing that they really needed was they needed to be justified. Right? They needed to be justified in the eyes of God. Because everybody sins. So everyone's fallen short of the glory of God. So everyone needs to be saved. But some people were not that bad. Right? I mean, I know folks like that. They ain't never done nothing wrong in their life. Not that we could tell. I mean, their sins are more like sins of omission or, or sins of, of, of wrong thinking or, or things like that where they've never really wronged anybody or harmed people. But you see, when you get down to the, the real deep, dark sinners... Those that maybe struggled with addiction. Because see, addiction is a powerful, powerful thing in someone's life. And if you don't think it is, then you need to look around the world around you. There's more people addicted to pain pills right now in Sampson County, in Harnett County, in Johnston County, all around us, pain pills. Look, that's the new drug of choice. And actually, you know what? A lot of times what happened to them? It was the doctor that did it to them. Right? Because you give them something that would knock an elephant down for a toothache and they take it long enough and guess what? Man, I'm starting to depend upon this feeling. Right? And we don't understand, folks. How could they get strung out on like that? Well, you take them for a couple weeks and see how you are. 
See, we look at everybody else and we condemn the sin in them that's not in us, right? We always look at the other sin. But see, there's times in our, in our walk where we, we are just down like that. And when God saved my soul, although in heaven, in the spiritual, I was perfected. I was as good as I could be, praise God, in the eyes of God. But yet I had to work out my walk. Because you see, now I've got to go back in the world. And now I've got to work out all of these things with fear and trembling. Lord, you tell me that I'm forgiven and I'm washed and I'm cleansed and I'm holy. But I'm a drug addict. Lord, you tell me that I'm cleansed, I'm holy, and all these things, but yet I have a, an addiction to pornography. And we can just throw things out. God, you tell me I'm holy, I'm righteous, I'm just, but I'm so prideful. Oh, I can't stand it. I'm never wrong. But I've got to walk in such a way that I exemplify the love of Christ. Isn't that where the rubber meets the road? It's not what God did. We know what God can do. Amen. But it's how do we walk out our salvation on a daily basis? Because see, everybody's watching us. And they're waiting for us to fall. They're waiting for us to waver. They're waiting for us to not show the love of Christ one time, just one time. We can show the love of Christ 99 out of 100 times. But that one time, all of a sudden... That's the one they're going to point to. I'm here to tell you that a lot of times where people stop is with salvation. And they never move on to holiness. Right? And see, and isn't that the big rub in the world today? When people talk about Christians, they say, well, you know, if they would act like a Christian, then maybe I could believe in the Jesus that they're telling me that has saved their soul. Right? And now people always, isn't that the excuse you always hear? That was the excuse I used. The reason why I didn't go to church was because I knew people that went to church. I knew them and I knew that there was ones in there that was a whole lot worse than me. As messed up of a soup sandwich as my life was. And yet I looked in the church and I saw people that were just as bad. And I was like, ooh. But there's something that we're supposed to strive for. It's called sanctification. It's called being made holy. You know who makes you holy? The Holy Spirit. He's the one that makes you holy. But you know how you allow him to work on you? You have to yield to the Spirit of God. See, many times we don't like to be told anything by anybody. And so we don't want to yield to God. And we wonder why we, we've not changed. And can I tell you the most miserable soul of all is one who has been saved but not been sanctified. One who on a daily basis knows that they made a profession of faith. They put their trust in Jesus. That in the spiritual realm they are holy. But in their physical realm, in their being, they are unrighteous. That they're walking in sin. On a daily basis that they're fighting and fighting and fighting. There's no more miserable person in this world. The one that, that sees the promise and yet can't walk it out. That's where sanctification comes in, folks. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 3 tells us this. It says, for this is the will of God. Look, there's a whole lot of things that we can talk about being the will of God. But this is pretty clear when the Bible says, this is the will of God. Even, even me, in my lowly theological standing, I can understand that when it says, this is the will of God, probably that's the will of God, right folks? Amen? That's the will of God. What's the will of God? Your sanctification. Have you ever thought about that? 
Have you ever thought that God doesn't want to leave you in your sin? Have you ever thought that God wants to take you down a path to where you become more and more like Him on a daily basis? Have you ever thought about that? You know, a lot of people don't yearn after righteousness anymore. They don't yearn after holiness no more. They don't yearn after any of those things. But yet the Word tells me this is the will of God, your sanctification. Now notice what they throw right on top first thing. That you should abstain from sexual immorality. I mean, that's right up top. How many, how many families have been torn apart in this country because of sexual immorality? And I don't care what you want to call it, adultery, fornication, whatever case you want to put after it. Sexual immorality. And he goes on further and says that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. When you walk your life, when you, when you live your life on a daily basis, are you walking in sanctification and honor? Are you possessing your vessel in such a way that people would look at you and say, that's one they're right there, now that one's sanctified. And see, then we get in a whole discussion about sanctification, about how sanctified somebody can be. Can they be entirely sanctified? Can they be absolutely perfect? No, they can't be absolutely perfect. There was only one that was perfect. His name is Jesus, right? But we can have the perfect love of God living in us that we can perfectly try to strive to follow God. I was thinking about this for a second. I was like, how am I going to make this discussion? How am I going to say that people can be sanctified? Because most would never admit it, right? I mean, if I asked all of you, raise your hand, you're who's sanctified out here today. Probably nobody would raise their hand, including the pastor, right? Because we know our hearts. We know the battles that rage inside of us. And every one of us has a different battle. Every one of us has a different pet sin that we, that we are struggling against at times. That we try to get free from, but we can't seem to get over the hump. That we hang on to that. And we, we want to be delivered, but, but we know that, that through the power of God, whew, we're able. But I also want you not to mistake temptation for sin. All right? The Bible says that Jesus was tempted in all ways, and yet without sin. So when you face temptation in your daily walk, that's not something that, that you need to just beat yourself up. Oh my gosh, I was tempted. You need to rejoice on the other side when you don't walk through the temptation. And that's called sanctification. When you're able to stand up in the temptation. When you're able to do those things. And a lot of folks, like they say, they don't want to call themselves sanctified. But there's people in the church that are sanctified. That are set aside. That have tried to pursue God with everything that they have. And that God has worked it out in their spirit. I want you to think about this for a second. Y'all ever remember when you started riding a bike? When you were little. And you remember. I know some of you probably had the ones with the big wheel. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, the whole world's going to revolve around this bike riding story. I can tell you right now, praise God. But I want you to understand something. If we start with justification and that we're, we're sanctified in the heavenlies and that God has sanctified us there where he's made us holy in his eyes, and right? He's forgiven us all our sin. He's washed us clean. He's cleansed us. That should be something to celebrate, right? Something to be excited about when you get saved. But it's kind of like giving somebody a bicycle. I remember the first bicycle I got. Of course, it was bought at a garage sale back then. Right? It wasn't a new, brand new bike. We never had new stuff when I was a kid. We had everybody else's old stuff. It was new to us, right? It's like a new used car. When you go, did you get a new car? No, it's a used car, but it's new to me, right? Hey, praise God. But so, so we, I got a bicycle at a, at a garage sale. And we lived on a hill on the top of a big old hill. And everywhere you went from the house, it was downhill. Okay? So they decided it was time for Rick to learn to ride the bike. Right, that's, get your image, get your little image going here. Little Rick, about five years old, all right? I'm on top of the hill, and, and I want you to understand something. When riding a bicycle, there's a whole lot of moving parts on a bicycle, right? Because you got to kind of hang on to the 
handlebars, and you got to pedal, and you got to, got to watch your speed. And if you push the pedal back, which they don't probably have them anymore, but back in the old days, we had coaster brakes. So, so if you were going forward, you're going, but if you push it back, you stop. And, you know, all these things you got to think about. I'm doing all this time. I'm going to ride the bike. Woo! I'm going to ride the bike. That's the way a lot of people are when they get saved. Oh, there's entirely too many moving parts in this salvation thing, and I don't know what to do. And I'm, You know what happened to me the first time I tried to ride the bike? I got on the bike. They said, and so my daddy, he was, you know, very helpful. He said, well, son, if you'll just get up on that hill right there and you just point her downhill. <laughs> Sounded good to the five-year-old. The only problem was we had a whole row of maple trees. And they were, you know, about yay far apart. What would be the chances of me hitting one of them trees? <laughs> Look, I'm here to tell you there was like a, a heat-seeking tree missile in the front of that bicycle. I don't know what happened, but I went down the hill, and I was pedaling as hard as I could, and I was just looking down and pedaling, and I run right into a tree. Bam! I didn't like riding a bike. <laughs> Who said this was fun? This is not fun. And now I'm scared to death. And they're like, well, Ricky, you just need to get up and get back up on the hill. Do I say I'm not going to hit a tree again? Are you crazy? There's too many moving parts on this thing. I don't know whether to pedal or stop or wiggle or move or steer or, or look up or down. or I don't know what to do. And they finally talked me into it. You know, you need to try this again. Try it again. So I got on the bike again. The next time I missed the trees but wiped out in the yard. A lot softer landing. Okay. Eventually, I got to where I could ride down that hill. And then imagine this. Eventually, I could ride around the driveway. I could ride all over and didn't even hit things. It's really cool. Right? So I learned how to ride the bike. Now I'm a bike rider. Okay? Well, let's look at our walk in Christ. When we first started... We were worried about everything. We were worried about how much do I have to pray every day? How much of the word do I need to read every day? How many times do I need to go to church? How much do I need to tithe? Is 10% enough or some weeks do I need to give 50, 60%? What do I need to do? I don't know how to do all these things. I don't know how to talk the talk. I don't know how to walk the walk. I don't know anything about this. I'm trying to be this and I'm thinking about everything all around me. You remember when you first got saved? And you were scared to death to say anything about anybody because you were afraid they were going to judge you by what you said. Oh, oh, no, that's theologically incorrect. No. And so we eventually walked with Christ on a daily basis. And we worked out our salvation with fear and trembling. And yet eventually, guess what? We got there. Now I don't think about how many hours I need to pray a day. I mean, I pray every day, but I don't think about exactly I've got to do exactly 37 minutes and 42 seconds or I'm going to bust hell wide open. I don't, I don't worry about um, how much am I going to read my Bible. Is five chapters enough or do I need to do ten because I'm a preacher? You know, I mean, I, I don't worry about those things anymore because I'm not worried about the, the intricacies like that anymore. I'm worried about living the life. I'm here to tell you, when you ride a bike now, those of you that know how to ride a bike, do you sit there and worry about pedaling and keeping your balance and steering and all that stuff? You just do it. Right? It's like when you get in your car and you drive somewhere. Those of you that have a driver's license, you drive. Do you think about driving that car? No, you just slam her in drive or reverse or whatever it is, and away you go. You don't think a thing in the world about driving. You don't concentrate on how you're doing it or looking down there or whatever. You just drive. That's being sanctified in the Spirit of God. That's being empowered by the Holy Ghost. That's being able to live out your salvation without fear and worry. That's sanctification. A lot of folks will never admit that they're there. But a lot of folks are there. A lot of folks are not worried about all the little individual intricacies of Christianity. They're now just following their Savior the best they can, praise God. That is being sanctified. That's being turning our way to Him. But I'm here to tell you that what happens when you get there, it says that you should abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust. 
like the Gentiles who do not know God. That no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter. Because the Lord is the avenger of all such. As we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness. But in holiness. We can all say that God called us to this or called it to that. And we talk about the calling on our life. That I'm called to do this. I'm called to do that. Can I tell you one thing you are called to do? Holy living. Living out the, the, the hope that's in you. Living through the power of God. Living through that. Now see, the whole thing is though is that we look at these things. Oh, and I'll just throw in verse 8 just because I need to throw that in. It says, therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. So when you reject the word of God, you're not rejecting man or the man that's preaching it or the one that's told you or whatever. You're rejecting God Almighty himself because it's his word. So as we, as we go there, I, I want to go back. To where we started. I want, I want to go back to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. It says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. I'm here to tell you today that if you want to live a holy life, it's not dependent upon your effort. Do you understand what I'm saying? You can't be good enough to be holy. I know people that try to work it out. They try to do everything they need to do. They try and try and try and try. I'm going to be holy. I'm going to be holy. I'm going to be holy. Can I tell you that there is no holiness without the Holy Spirit of God giving you the power to live it out. Because you can't do it without Him. You can't separate the two. See, so many times we want to separate our effort from God's effort. The Word of God tells me that I'm supposed to yield myself. I'm supposed to yield these members, right, to godliness. I'm supposed to give them to God. I'm supposed to give them everything I have. When they called the priests, they would anoint them. They would touch them. trying to remember how it goes was it the ear yes or no Jane do you remember Jane's looking at me like I'm crazy I'm trying to remember they definitely did the hand and the foot can I tell you what that stands for that stands for everything that you do and everywhere you go you go in the power of God I want you to understand that for a second. See, a lot of folks, they're trying to work out their salvation, and they're absolutely miserable because they're working it out. They're, they're struggling with sin. They're struggling with things in their lives that they can't, they can't get over. They can't get around them. They can't get past them. They can't do those things because they, they don't have the power in them. And I'm here to tell you that the power is not resident in you. It's in the Holy Ghost. It's in the power of God that changes people. That's where you see folks that are making no progress because they're not yielding to God. Sanctification. I know it's a scary word. It's a big, huge word. It's something that, that means that we're being made holy. Can I tell you that it happens all at once and in a process? Right? All at once when you're justified, when you're saved. Oh my goodness, God sanctifies your spirit. You are sanctified in the heavenlies. But then it works out in your life. On a daily basis. I don't know why I'm here today. Why I'm on this. Somebody need to hear this today. Okay? Somebody need, somebody right now is working themselves to death. Okay? They're working, 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 working. I'm trying to be righteous. I'm trying to be righteous. I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. And all they're doing is being more frustrated and more frustrated and feeling like they're being alienated from God and that there's a wall in between and you can't seem to get. I'm here to tell you, yield to God. Yield. And let Him work through you. 
as you yield the portions of your life that need to be touched by God, God will change them. And through that, he will change you. Let's go ahead and close today. I, uh, I want to call forward those that, that wanted to be prayed over and anointed this morning. I know that there were some that, that want to be prayed over and anointed today. So I want to call you forward this morning. If you would come forward as we, as we pray over you today. Those that would like to stand in for someone. Amen. The reason we call these folks forward is because we believe that there's power in the laying on of hands. Amen? There's going to be a transfer of power. There can be a transfer of the Holy Spirit. There can be healing. There can be all kinds of things. Restoration. Um, all kinds of things that take place through the laying on of hands. And if I asked everybody in the church this morning, I asked, do you believe in healing by God? I don't think there's a person in the house that would say, no, I don't believe that God can heal someone. But yet the very same people would say that God cannot sanctify someone. I want you to think about that for a second. You know, we pick, we select what we believe sometimes. I'm here to tell you today, if he can heal through these folks that are standing here in the gap for their loved ones this morning. I know we're lifting Daniel up today, praise God. We're also lifting Rose up today. Um, you know, God's going to touch these folks. I believe that with all my heart. And, and if God can heal, then God can forgive sin. Then God can wash us clean. Then God can set us free. Right? What would be worse than, than to have a God where he saw you in the trap or your foot was in the trap? And all he's got to do is, is open the trap and let you be free. And he stands there and said, I could let you out, but I'm not going to. As you squirm. God's not going to leave us in our sin. And God's going to heal these folks today in the name of Jesus.
Hora! 